Cody 11-1 youth. It's Mr. Max here, and this is Tony. Hey guys. We're on a road trip right now. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Been on a road trip in the last couple days, so haven't had the chance to uh, do the sermon for you guys, so we got a special treat. We got Anthony's a youth master here in San Diego, where we're headed right now. Hello. And He's a high school youth pastor at North Coast Christian Church, and I went down and visited a while ago, a couple weeks ago or months ago, you guys probably remember. Anyways, he's got a super cool sermon that I already heard, and I loved it, so I want you guys to hear it. So, for the challenge of the week, I'm going to give you guys an extra week on those dog video, uh, pictures. Dress up your, well, I don't know what animals you guys have. Dress up your pet in the best costume, make it original. You got one more week, the winner will get that gift box. So make it good. And also, tomorrow, Monday night, we're gonna be meeting up and having some pizza, um, social distancing and whatnot. I'll text everyone with more details, but that's tomorrow. So get your challenge in, Monday, tomorrow. I think that's it. So sit back, relax, and listen to Anthony's smooth voice. What's up, Clyde? My name is Anthony, and of course you know me by now, but I thought I'd just say it, you know, because we're on video, so I don't know who's watching. But uh, we are in our last, um, our last point of Not Easily Broken, our last sermon in this series of Not Easily Broken. And just to recap, since we're in our last point, this whole series has been about, it's not if a storm comes, but it's when a storm comes. And just to make sure that we are all rooted and we're grounded and, and we're solid in our faith so that when those storms come in our life, we're not broken down, we're not quickly broken, but those storms actually build us up. And I talked about, uh, in the first two weeks, I talked about prayer and how prayer should be the first thing we run to, should be our first line of defense for the Christian. And I also talked about uh, this quote that Corey Ten Boom says, but she says, uh, she asked the question, is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? Meaning, as a Christian, do we live our lives completely dependent on God, completely dependent in prayer, or do we just use prayer as a last resort? Do we use it when we're in trouble? And then um, Josh talked about, uh, last week he talked about reading the Bible as 100% truth by living, the Bi by living the Bible out, by using the Bible as not just like this, this book of mythical tales, but, but actually taking it as 100% truth and applying it to your life. And that is a way we can say 100% not easily broken. And so I want to cover um, this last topic in this series. If you guys are taking notes, make sure you have your Bible and your notebook. The, the, the title of this, of this message is Becoming Anti-Fragile. Becoming Anti-Fragile. So, but, but before we jump in, I'm going to pray for us and uh, pray with me. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for everything that you're doing in quarantine, God, you have a purpose for this season. This season is not wasted, and I declare that, God, you have a purpose for this in every single one of our lives. So would you show us the purpose, and God, would we live out that purpose on purpose? God, we praise you for who you are. In your name I pray, amen. I used purpose like 20 times in that prayer, but whatever, man. Um, but so not easily broken or becoming anti-fragile because the enemy, the enemy does not want you to be uh, he, actually, the enemy wants you to be easily broken. The enemy wants, wants your faith to be easily broken. The enemy wants you to, your faith to be dependent on what you feel like that day. Like, oh, I don't really feel like reading the Bible. Oh, I don't really feel like praising God. The enemy would love if your faith was dependent on circumstance. He, he would love if your faith was like, is like uh, when you run to God only when you have troubles, like when people were rushing to the grocery stores because they thought the world was ending. Same thing, the enemy would love if you just ran to God only when you are in trouble. And the rest of the time when life is good, you're, who's God, what God? And, and the enemy would also love when, um, that if, if your faith was only dependent on what you can get out of it. Like, as long as, as, long as my life's good, mm, I'm, on, I'm on team Jesus. Otherwise, pff, who the heck's this guy? Like he would love if your faith was dependent on that thing. Or he, the enemy would love if every single day you woke up in the morning and you put God on trial. Like you woke up and you're like, what has God done for me lately? Oh, pff, nothing good? Okay, well then, 
Screw, screw God, he's not my God. And, and, and there's all these different circumstances where, where a lot of our times we as the cultural Christian live our lives dependent, our faith is dependent on our circumstance, our faith is determined on what friends we have, on if life is good, and the enemy loves that. And then our faith is easily broken. But here's the thing, is God doesn't want your faith to be like that. God wants our faith to be rooted and grounded in Jesus, rooted and grounded in the word of God. God wants our faith to be mature, to be solid, to be on a secure foundation. God wants our faith to be not easily broken. And that's why we're gonna keep diving into this idea of not easily broken in our faith, not just our personality, but not just in our circumstance, but in our faith, because that is so important. That is the essential thing for the Christian. So if... So if you, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. When you're there, go hip, hip. But while you're turning there, I, I found this quote, and I love this quote. Uh, it, this guy actually wrote a book uh, called Anti-Fragile. And he says this. He says, if you're fragile and life hits you hard, you're going to break. And he says, if you, are, uh, if you are resilient and life hits you hard, you'll probably withstand it. But you'll probably eventually break. Being anti-fragile, on the other hand, means when life hits you hard, and I mean hard, you actually get stronger. When life hits you, you get stronger. And he says, a wind extinguishes a candle, but wind accelerates a flame. I love that. I love that. Because there's a difference, there's this happy medium between being, being fragile and being resilient. But he says, no, we shouldn't be either of those things. We should be right in, in a different category of being anti-fragile. But when we get hit as a Christian, we actually become stronger because of it. So, so when you get hit, you become stronger. And that's what anti-fragile means. And it, it talks about that in Romans 8, verse uh, 37. So if you're there, uh, would, you, would you please read with me? Paul says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor present things to come, or powers, nor height, or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says, whatever is going on in your life, whatever is happening in your life, whatever ex external circumstances and internal circumstances are going on, nothing will be able to tear you away from our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you, and we're gonna turn to 2 Corinthians 4.19. Well, you don't have to turn there with me, but I just have the message version. And, and these, these people, these Christians are talking about this resiliency or this, being of, this becoming of anti-fragile. And they say, We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God has never left my side. We've been thrown down, but we have not been broken. What they did to Jesus, they did to us. Trial, torture, mockery, murder. That's what they, they did that to Jesus, and they do it to us, but Jesus lives. Our lives are at constant sake, at risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life more evident in us. These Corinthian people, uh, Paul has been, was writing to them, and he says, we have been beaten down, but we're not destroyed. We're actually, I love this part. He goes, we don't know what to do. We know that our God knows what to do. We've been tortured. We've been beat, but God has never left my side. This resiliency, this, this state of mind of being anti-fragile is realizing that when the storm comes, that we become stronger because of it, because the wind extinguishes a candle, but it fuels a fire. Right, you guys remember that? Like on Wednesday nights when I'm trying to make a fire out there with uh, Pam and uh, the lighter, and, and, and then it's not working, but then I go, <sighs> And I just start blowing on it like a ton. Well, that, well, that like it, I just blow on the embers, I blow on the embers, and I blow on the embers as much as I can, and then it goes, and that moment feels the fire. And just keep blowing on it, and it keeps building up the fire, building up the fire, building up the fire. But if we're fragile, then we'll be like a candle. When you blow on it, it'll just go out. Which, which side is your faith on? Is your faith... Is your faith on this side of the spectrum where it's dependent on circumstances and it's fragile, it's easily broken, it's, de it's determined on your circumstances, or, or is your faith over on this side, is it resilient, but you're just, oh, I'm just surviving, I'm just gonna get through it? Or is your faith on the front end where it's anti-fragile, 
Where when a storm comes, you, you praise God in the midst of the storm. When the storm comes, you are stronger because of it. When the storm comes, you are like the Corinthians that were beaten, but they were not destroyed. They, they knew their God has never left their side. And that is the meaning of anti-fragile. And so if you guys uh, are continue to follow me in your Bible, we're going to go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And when you're there, go, yep, yep. Remember, got my sweet coffee? Mm, okay. James chapter 1. I love this, but at first it was confusing to me. I'm going to be honest. James is at the end of the Bible near uh, after Hebrews. So I'm going to read this. James 1 chapter 2 through 4. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. James writes this, he's the brother of Jesus, and he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. And he says, it's a testing of your faith. These trials are a testing of your faith. But if you look back at the word of that, that word testing, that word testing actually is, is the same word that, that, that goldsmiths and silversmiths would use, the word testing. See, see, the way that silversmiths would deem that their silver was pure was, was they would put their silver in a big pot, they'd put all their silver in this pot, and they'd put it in the furnace, they put it, and, and then the fire of the furnace would heat the pot, would heat the pot, and it would heat the silver. And actually, on the inside of the pot, the impurities of the silver would come to the top, and the, the silversmith would wipe the top of the silver to get all the impurities off, and he would do this again. And he repeat this process of putting this pot of silver into the furnace, into the furnace. The impurities would rise up, he'd wipe the top. The, he'd put it back, in the, and he'd complete, he would continue to do this, and the way that a silversmith would deem himself, would deem uh, the silver pure is by when, when the silversmith would look at the pot of silver, he would deem it pure by if he could see his own reflection in it. And that's the same thing, this, the, the, the same word that testing. What trials do to us is it puts us in the fire of our faith. It tests our faith. It puts, it puts us in this pot in the fire. And, 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 and our trials, the trials in our life bring the impurities up. They bring the ugliness, the sin, the pride, the grossness of, of what God hates up out of us and God wipes the impurities away and he continues this process with us throughout our life and the way God deems us pure is when he looks at us, he sees his own reflection. And that, and, and so we cannot waste this, we can't waste trials in our life. The storms, the suffering that comes, when we are anti-fragile, we realize that God doesn't cause our suffering, but he uses our suffering. He uses our suffering with, on purpose. So if you look at the Bible, like, like the book of Job, the guy went through a ton of, of bad stuff. He lost everything. He lost his, uh, his, his daughters, his sons. He lost everything. And Job's wife looks at him and he goes, look, look at you. Job's wife says this. Look at you. you your God has left you. Just curse your God and die. And what does Job do? He's lost everything. He has boils all over his skin. His friends are yelling at him. His wife is telling him to curse God. That this is what Job does. Instead of cursing God and saying, God, forget you. My, because my life isn't going well, I don't need you. He doesn't say that, but instead he says, he bows his knee and he says, he said, God gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he just blesses God. And he praises and he worships God in the middle of the storm because he understood that God has a proven track record of bringing beauty out of ashes. God has a proven track record of bringing the good out of bad. He, God uses the cross, the worst torture tool in history to bring us life. He, he uses... He uses that tool to, for his son to die, to give us life, to give us forgiveness so that we can have a, so we can have a never ending love of, from Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul says, right? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ that Christ Jesus has for you, has for me. Nothing, not even your sin, not even my stupidity can take me away from Jesus because he loves us so much. And so what does is, what is anti-fragile look like, right? Because I'm, I'm up talking this anti-fragile thing. 
but it looks a lot like having a root system. A lot like having a root system. Because without a root system, right, like the parable of the seed Jesus talks about, without having a root system, it'll just fall over. Without having a root system, it'll just wither up and die. And so if you guys want to turn your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew 7, verse 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Matthew is the first of the Gospels. I remember someone, someone uh, a comedian saying that when he first read the Bible, he wasn't a Christian. He'd never heard of this. He read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he says, man, this guy, Jesus, he just keeps dying. He's died four times already. This is insane. <laughs> but I, I thought it was hilarious. But, he, uh, but yeah, so we're going to turn to Matthew, the first book of the Gospels. Uh, Matthew 7, verse 24. Jesus says this parable. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And, then the and when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, it didn't fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rain fell and the flood came and the winds blew and beat against the house, it fell and... And the and the great fall and it was a great fall. And if when we when we read that, um, I I thought I thought that was I thought it's pretty funny because it's, it's like we hear that up in, growing up in Sunday school, like why would you build your house on sand? That's super dumb. But actually, in the summer, Jesus was talking it was it was talking uh, giving this in this like near the Sea of Galilee, and actually in the summertime the sand by the Sea of Galilee would get hard as a rock would be as hard as a rock. So, uh, so a new family coming in, they're moving in there, they're moving in this, near the Sea of Galilee, coming from California, and, and they're seeing this, this spot right by, the, by, right by the Sea of Galilee. And, and, they, and they test, they test this, uh, this sand, but it's actually hard as rock. They're like, oh, we could totally build a house on it. So, so, so it, they would be like, it would go over their heads. And both houses, so both of these houses, the house built on the rock and the house built on the sand, they'd both be beautiful. Like, have you seen uh, Fix Dropper with Chip and Joanna Gaines? Mm. Beautiful houses. Both of these houses would be beautiful, right? They'd have the shiplap, they'd have the black trim, white house, oh, beautiful. It'd be a, these both would be beautiful. But when the storm came, there was one difference, is their foundation, their one difference was their foundation. And, and it's crazy because when you read that, that parable, Jesus says both of these men or, or both of these people, they, they heard the word of God. So the first person, he, he heard the word of God and he applied it to his life and he, and he did it. He did what God said. And the second person, he, he heard the word of God did not apply it to his life, did not, did not carry this relationship with God, but, but he heard it. And his house washed away in the storm because his foundation wasn't solid. And if you look at that story, the second person who built his house on the sand, that is a cultural Christian. That is, that, that, that is a Christian who, who i.e., goes to church, he goes to youth group, he or she, they, they hear the word of God, they hear the teaching of God, but they never apply it. And that is a cultural Christian because your foundation, the foundation of the cultural Christian is not solid. So that's a hard question for you and me to ask, which one are you? Are, is, you is your life built on the rock, the foundation of Jesus Christ and applying the word of God, or is your, the foundation of your life on the sand? Because the power of the power of, of God is not just in knowing, but it's in applying. It is not just knowing, but it's in applying. And I want to end with this. If, you, if you're taking notes, how do we build our root system? How do we build this foundation? How do we build this? I'll, take notes. I love this. So if you have, uh, yeah, so if you're taking notes, the first thing I want you to do and how you build your root system is, number one, a buddy system. Build a buddy system. Because you, you guys know when you're on field trips, like, you know, Billy and Johnny, they're walking. All right, guys, buddy system. Make sure if, you go, if you're going to go to the bathroom, you take a buddy with you. But, like, then little Billy, he doesn't, he doesn't keep up with Johnny. And then Johnny goes in the woods because he hears a, a giggle. And then little Johnny gets eaten by a clown. And then Billy doesn't even know he's gone. And then Billy goes to the teacher. And when they're, when they're doing the head count, uh, well, Johnny's dead, okay? And Billy doesn't even know. But... So, so buddy system, what do, I mean, what do I mean by the buddy system? It's choosing a buddy, the right buddy, or buddies. Someone 
to, uh, to report to the teacher that you're gone or, or, to, uh, um, or to report to the Lord or just to be accountable to keep you on track. That is a buddy system. So if you, uh, Ecclesiastes 4 says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their work. For if they fall, one will lift up his brother. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has no one to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they can keep each other warm. But how can one keep themselves warm by themselves? And this is the fourth, this is it. This is the money, money verse. Though a man might, quit, might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. That's the title of our sermon series. Isn't that crazy? But so it's building a buddy system, a group of guys or girls, or having a, girl, a guy or a girl or a buddy st- try to stay within the same gender or else you're going to try to date them, okay? But, so, but God wants, to keep, uh, wants your lives to have a, the benefit of the buddy system, to keep you accountable, to have someone looking out for you. Someone, out, someone praying for you. Someone who texts you verses in the morning saying, hey, this verse really encouraged me. So get a buddy system. Number two is having your sound system. Having your sound system. So right, take that note, sound system. You know those people who are like driving down uh, Main Street, Ramona, and they have their bass turned up, and they go, like super cool music? Yeah, well, that's what I'm talking about. And, and, and they're driving, and, and, and you're trying to get their attention, like it's your friend, like, hey, hey, and, they're, and, they're, and they can't even hear you. They're just focused on the music. They're focused on the road. That's what I'm talking about. Having your sound system in play. Because uh, when storms come, when, when all these things come in your life, having a, a loud sound system, meaning having, uh, like Job did, that no matter what happens to your life, no matter what bad comes, no matter what good comes, he, Job praised God. Having your praise level be up here, like all the way up to 100 all the time. So getting a buddy system, getting your sound system, because although praising God might not change your current circumstance, praising God will always change your heart. Always change your heart. And lastly, uh, a last way to build the root system is a, is a solar system. A solar system. Write that down, solar system. A solar system is objects in orbit around a, great, a greater heavenly body. So if you think about our solar system, like we have like uh, Mercury, Mars, the Earth, Venus, like all these different planets orbiting around the sun, right? It takes us 365 days to orbit around the sun. But the reason why we have to get this, this solar system in check in our brains is because we have to realize that we, are, that we, you and me, are not the most important thing in the universe. We're not the sun, we're not, the, we're not the center of our own world. But, but, but to realize we are a, a solar system is to realize that we are all at work together in unison, orbiting around the biggest, most important thing, and that's God. And that's Jesus. That's your relationship with God. To realize that I'm not the center, I'm not the most important thing, but God is, and it's not about you. Your life is not about you. It's not about me. My life is not about me. But, but your existence here, my existence, is, is only, is only the, our purpose is to give praise to God. And so in, if, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Paul writes, he says, So whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all to the glory of God. So to close this series, to close this uh, not easily broken series, Make sure you are anti-fragile. Make sure that when, when, when you get hit hard, when life, when the storm hits hard, that your foundation isn't on the sand, but is on the rock of Jesus. That you are applying the word of God to your life. You are reading the Bible. And to continue to build up your buddy system, your sound system, and your solar system. I love you guys. And my heart for you is that when the storm comes in your life, that you don't get destroyed, you don't get knocked down, but you get better. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for everything that you're doing in our lives. God, I pray that you continue to help us build this root system, this buddy system, 
this sound system, this solar system, God, this thing, these things inside of us, God, where we're praising you, we're realizing that we're not the center of our own universe, God, that our life is about you. God, if you want me to be a, a, a janitor somewhere, God, it's, it's all dependent on you, Lord. It's whatever gives you the most glory. So would we ask you those questions, not what do I want to do, but God, what do you need me to do to fulfill your purpose? And God, I thank you so much that you are at work in every single one of our lives and that nothing can separate us from the love that you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.